You ready, bud? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, keep getting your pizza and your refreshments. Uh, we have an exciting speaker for you to enjoy while you're eating and thinking. Uh, my name is Mike McDonald. I'm Associate Dean for the School of Education and Human Services. It's my honor and uh, privilege to be able to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the School of Education and Human Services. Um, wonderful colleagues, campus community here today to celebrate autism awareness and then some. If you look at the bag, you'll see that the date was yesterday. And actually that's not too bad of a, of a, of a bit of a glitch because yesterday was about awareness. Today we're moving towards inclusion. And somewhere in the middle, acceptance has to happen as well. The post-secondary community really has a responsibility to model and to give back and to be the middle point between P12 and the other world. In fact, we can be better and we can set the bar. The speaker you're going to hear today is going to bring us towards understanding how inclusion through the strengths, the needs, and the interests of all learners, particularly those with autism spectrum disorders, have um, bring to their learning experience at the, at the, the post-secondary community and what we can do as faculty, staff, and OU community members to further support and perhaps ourselves gain a better understanding of what life is about and how we can be a better part of that through the, understanding the unique challenges and digging deep inside ourselves to make a better community for all. So I'm going to next introduce Kristen, who will uh, do the honor of uh, giving you a bit more background on Spencer and tell you a little bit about his journey and how he arrives here today. I thank the organizers. I know these things don't happen out of thin blue air. Um, I know that this takes a lot of work. I commend those who uh, provided uh, all the efforts that got us to this point here today. And I, again, I'm especially grateful that we extended it awareness into inclusion by way of two days of acknowledging and perhaps extending that into 365 and a quarter days of understanding. So thank you Spencer in advance. Thank you Kristen and a whole team that's responsible for getting this wonderful day together. I'd like you to give all a round of applause. Again, um, it's my, um, so I'm Kristen Rohrbeck, I'm the Director of Outreach within the Center for Autism, so the Joanne and Ted Lindsay Foundation Autism Outreach Services within the Center for Autism here on campus. Thank you, Mike, for saying a few words to welcome everyone today. And I first, or I should say, I next want to make sure to name those individuals who did a lot to really help today. So um, Julia Key, Kristen Pollock, um, a number of other graduate students who are within the School of Education Human Services Human Development and Child Studies program um, has really done a lot to help not only organize but execute today. So thank you to them, thank you to everyone within HGCS who's been very supportive um, and within the entire Center for Autism. This is a, an entire Center for Autism initiative to continue these events. So thanks to everyone for um, helping today and for coming. And it's my um, real, um, honor to introduce Spencer today. So Spencer is an individual with autism spectrum disorder who is an Oakland University student. He's a successful young business owner of Expedition Soap Company. He has multiple speaking engagements that he does throughout the year and he's done for years now. Um, and he's only 17 going on 18 years old. Um, including um, being a guest panelist at USA Autism's World Conference on Autism, TEDx Detroit, and local universities um, and, and schools as well, including coming back and talking to the OU CARES community. So if you like what Spencer's um, has to say today, you're welcome to come back to hear him talk about how he is an, an entrepreneur and how to um, kind of be successful in the ways that he has as well. There's some information on your, on your tables about that. Spencer has also been featured in many magazines, local and national newspapers, including USA Today, Fox 2 Detroit Health Works, and CB6 
CBS 62 Ion Detroit segments. So thank you again, and please welcome, um, join me in welcoming Spencer Kelly. Thank you all for coming out uh, for the free food. Uh, it turns out you also get a speech with autism with it, so you know, I'll keep you entertained over lunch. In all seriousness, I really appreciate you guys coming out. It means a lot. My goal here is to relay some good information for everyone so that those of you who are involved in the classroom can better understand, <clears throat> can understand us a little better. The cause of autism means a lot to me, mostly because someone very close to me has autism. I wonder who that is. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that a little help goes a very long way. One day I was in a microeconomics class here at Oakland University, and here I am, a junior in high school in a class of college students. Waiting for the test scores that day, you could feel the bleak and barren nature of the classroom from the off-white walls to the chalkboard that's been written on a hundred times. I came in, the weather outside was terrible, I came inside feeling like I had frostbite. I was under a lot of stress personally because at the time I was going through a rough interview with a national TV show and my math class wasn't going too well that year. On top of that, I was going through a rough experience with a girl. So suffice to say, all these factors piling on top of you, it left me in a real stressful state. Now, I'm not saying I, I just wasn't in a mood to receive a poor grade. Not saying, I did, not saying I didn't deserve it, I did. <laughs> but it just wasn't an easy pill to swallow. On top of that, I thought the score that I got would be higher. I studied hard for this test and had sort of an all or nothing mentality when it came to it. I thought if I got a good score, if, if I, <clears throat> I thought if I got a good score, I wouldn't be stressed anymore. Now when the test scores came back, I got a 70%. With all these factors combined, it felt like I'd worked all this time for nothing. I felt sick to my stomach. Now, one thing you know about you may know about the condition of autism is that people who have autism have a very hard time controlling their feelings. For somebody with autism, stress very quickly builds into anxiety. So having all these conditions at once, well, it proved to be almost too much. I knew it broke down right there in the classroom. However, I knew that I couldn't. So, I took myself out of the classroom. Hey, the best part of college, you can just up and leave class anytime you want, whenever you want to. <laughs> and I went to the bathroom to vent. The score really hurt. Now, looking back at the moment, it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, far worse thing that could happen to you in life. Of course, since people with autism have trouble with the theory of mind, which is a subject I'll explain later, I may as well have accidentally set up a nuclear bomb with how the score I got. So, it took me a while to become rational, but I still was a little upset. I got myself into a state where I could return to the classroom, and probably didn't. It felt terrible the entire time, but fortunately, I had a friend in the class who helped me put things into perspective. On a side note, being a, having autism, it, it can sometimes make you an egotist bigger than Julius Caesar himself. Of course, whether or not he was autistic, <coughs> well, that's actually a speech for another day. <laughs> Now on top of that, the professor and I were on really good terms, and he was very friendly and understanding of the situation. And don't worry, later on I went on to get a 4.0 in this class, so everything worked out in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Now, that was one scenario. I'm happy to say that things ended up working out really well, and that overall it ended up being a positive experience. And I'm also happy to say that was the last time I ever experienced something like that. I took matters into my own hands and came up successful. However, note that I said this was one scenario. Autism is a spectrum of disability. You can never generalize people with autism because they're very, very individualistic. 
Everyone has their own quirks, but by delving into the autism community, you'll begin to truly understand what I mean by this. For example, let's look at this scenario. Different people with different types of autism may have reacted differently. Some people may have seen this as a huge stepping stone for the path in the career, taking a 70% time of test very happily. Some may have reacted in a, like I did, but perhaps in an even worse manner. Some may have not even noticed what was going on at all. Autism has so many different <coughs> and so many different variables to it. You may be wondering right now from the way I'm talking, hey, this medical guy, does he have autism? Yes, yes I do. Apparently, you need to either have a PhD or have autism to speak about the condition. Since I'm only 17 years old and my medical knowledge goes for just barely further than CPR, it goes to about, if you can't put on a band-aid, amputate. <laughs> There's only one logical explanation here. Having autism has always been a struggle, but I'm here to talk about how it affects people in the classroom, not just in normal life. If I'm going to be honest with you, aren't you in there not teaching anybody how to cook spaghetti? <laughs> but first and foremost, classrooms just aren't built around the autistic person. Now, fair enough, since only a very small percentage of the population has autism. However, the issues autistic people have are a bit more nuanced in a lot of ways. They need, need, need structure and routine. Personally, I've never skipped a class. I want to, I just never got around to it. This isn't the fault of colleges, but more an incidental part of autism. In college, you have changing professors, changing TAs, changing hours, changing rooms, spring break, and so many more ways to mess up a schedule. Not including the fact that you can't skip class which really doesn't help in this case. In high school, it's easy to make a direct schedule for someone with autism to follow. In college, let's take OU as an example. You ever been to math and science building or Dodge Hall? It's hard enough for a neurotypical person to find their way around to those halls. <laughs> Especially when you realize that 250 and 249 are on different sides of the building. <laughs> now, they need to navigate these difficult, these different spaces while having trouble with change. Especially when situations change rapidly, people with autism tend to struggle. They have a tough time being adaptive. Change that ruins a moment. I'm saying this as sort of a, an attempt to generalize and put it into a very concrete term for what this is. Coming back to the theory of mind points earlier, autistic people have a trouble with the whole concept of live and learn. For example, let's take mistakes. Making mistakes is something that, <coughs> when you have autism, making mistakes is tough, okay? You, um, rather than being able to learn from the mistake initially, you're going to get very upset about it because you think, oh no, I messed this up, oh no, everything's gone, oh no. <laughs> well, most statistics possess at least average intelligence. This inability to learn from the mistakes makes a normal style of education very hard to work with. I train myself to learn from mistakes, but even simply something simple like you know forgetting to put something back in the fridge can still be gut wrenching for me. It also results in the stubbornness commonly associated with autism. For example, I mean think about it: if it's hard to learn from mistakes, and it's going to be hard to learn from <coughs> it's going to be hard to learn from the scenarios that happen. And they can't, they simply, it's hard for them to deal with the rapid change quickly enough to function in society. Now, without help. Quality therapy can change this, it can let you live a much more independent life. But the challenge will always be there, it never goes away. When somebody with autism is learning, they tend to like repetition. If somebody doesn't inherently like making mistakes, and by, and by the same way learning new things, well, there's only one way that's going to go. It becomes very easy to get set into. For example, whenever I study, I like studying by reading outside of the class more than actually being in the class and learning from the teacher. Not because I dislike the, not because I dislike the professor, but because it's easier for me to repeat a concept and to learn it properly, at least in the way I like to think of things. <clears throat> A way that professors can not only help these students, but also the rest of their students, is by utilizing teacher notes. I've had several professors already who have used teacher notes, and it's to great success. Simply put, having the notes there for you to read and understand already made by the professor is very helpful. Another way that focuses more on people with autism is 
via sort of an arranged seating chart. Now, most students are going to get the exact same education, regardless of where they sit in the classroom. However, people with autism have difficulties with language. English is a very complex language. There's so many double meanings. So, for example, somebody with autism, if they're in the back of the room and they miss a word of what the professor is saying, well, they're not going to know what to do. They're going to be freaking out about what context. They're going to be trying to understand how they can work this concept. It can get confusing quick, even if you miss one word. You feel like, what just happened? Now, doing something simple as preferential seating, or arranged seating, it would be helpful for, it's practically free for university. It gives the autistic student more help than you know. And it doesn't give anybody an unfair advantage. Finally, professors should use more graphic organizers. Everybody likes it, not just people with autism. <laughs> Look, I get it. When you're transferring Newton's third law into mathematical concepts, it's easy to just write it all down. But at least having the basics and something a bit more graphic is going to be nice. Next, I suggest you talk to your professor. Pretty simple. So why am I telling you this? If you have autism, <coughs> talk to your professor. Talking to your professor at their office hours, I get it. If you have autism, it's very easy just to say whatever's on the top of your head. But maybe not when they're retrieving tests. Just a little head right there. Now, this is the most important step you can take because, simply put, professors aren't high school teachers. They're teaching you, they're professing to you their ideas that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. They're not just teaching you so you can get on a good, uh, an A on a test and get the school district some extra money. They'll be more understanding if you have learning difficulties. They'll be more understanding if you might need help in one area that they can help you with. And also, you need to do this to see if the professor is correct for you. Look, it's university. Nobody minds if you switch a professor for a class. It happens all the time. There's no shame in it either. The, this crucial step will create some understanding of the scenario for the professor. It gives the professor the context to the student's problem in case of, let's say, a situation. Perhaps if the student is not doing well in the class. Now, a fact sheet is a nice way to introduce yourself to the professor, especially if they're busy, for example, a math lecture. Just one thing, though. Make it a sheet, not a book. <laughs> now, this is where, thanks to the Disability Support Services, or DSS, you can get more specialized help here at Oakland University. They provide services like no takers and extended test time. They also vet every one of the clients of their services, so don't worry, nobody's getting an unfair advantage by going to them for any sort of help. I've worked with them before when I was having trouble in a class, and they were very sweet, very friendly, and very <coughs> happy to help. And I can say nothing but good things about them. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Nobody, again, nobody will think less of you if you ask for help. This is why we have tutors. Nobody's perfect, so take as much help as you need. And personally, I've learned from my discussion with autism experts that the main issue with teachers and professors is the lack of awareness. Not of autism, mind you, but of how to properly work with someone in the classroom who has autism. Class in college, the professor is slam packed with assignments to grade. Classes are also much bigger here in college, so they also have to prepare for the lectures, the university requirements, office hours, writing dissertations. We get the idea. While the classes may be still at its standard here at Oakland University, a professor likely doesn't have enough time to know every person individually and to provide one on one help while in class. They simply don't have the time to be extensively trained for a specialized condition. Well, it would be very selfish and very utopian of me to demand that every professor go through some sort of rigorous, study, strenuous course. I would like to see more basic skills covered. Rather, <coughs> rather than being thrown in a situation with no idea how to deal with the situation, the professor can have understanding, maybe to help the person calm down, to help the person understand maybe more of the concepts being taught in the class. <coughs> This would allow them to work with autistic students better while not constraining their time away from the majority of the students. Then there's homework and coursework. Everybody gets it, but people with autism have this really special way of procrastinating on their work. Trust me, I know from personal experience I once cleaned my entire house rather than do some schoolwork. 
Now this is lethal in college, since all that work you're doing is going to matter down the line. Now when these students were at home, they had their parents to help them make schedules. This, whether intentionally or not, creates a sort of learned helplessness, where the student requires the parent to be there with them in order to have, facilitate a schedule. Now this works. Now this may work in high school, but in college, without the structure, it becomes easy to go off and to go off and do something else instead of do the schoolwork. Now this solution is is very simple. Just even if you don't have autism, just write a schedule and stick to it. Maybe watch a video on how to make a schedule so you can find which, whatever works for you. I know this sounds a bit arbitrary, but a schedule helps more than you know. Now, if you have a team project with your schedule, maybe you can make more of a weekly schedule that can fluctuate. And double points if you have something cool at the end of the week, like if you follow the schedule, like eating food that isn't 10 cent ramen or cafeteria food. <laughs> now, people with autism also struggle with studying due to their difficulties in writing down what they hear. This task is difficult due to the difference in how they receive information. The way they receive information, their brains are constructed entirely differently than a normal person. In my personal experience, I struggle with note-taking because I just don't learn that way. The skill of the autistic person to listen to the professor, look at the chalkboard, and write down everything that's going on, it can be almost too much at times. I know this may seem normal to you, but for someone with autism, doing these multiple things at once can be very hard to juggle. Now, personally, I prefer to read, and in class it can be really frustrating sometimes. And the time limits are also an issue in college. Since a college professor is working hundreds of kids during the school year, again, it's just unlikely that they can provide any sort of specialization for someone. This isn't mentioning tests, which I personally struggle with. Many college tests simply aren't very specific and clear, leading to autistic people not understanding the work. This will lead to many of them struggling in college, where you must develop an understanding of what the test is asking, rather than what the test is literally saying. You know, abstract thought and whatnot. A quick tidbit that I think would help <coughs> before class would be if the autistic persons could sort of discuss maybe the concepts that are going to be taught before the test in some way. For example, if they could understand what the test is going to be asking them, rather than just going in blind and having no idea how the test is supposed to be written, and likewise then not having any idea of how they're supposed to do the test. Now, unfortunately, you can't do too much for some genetically inflicted issues. Autistic people have troubles in several areas regarding this. First and foremost, and perhaps the most famous, is sensory overload. This is where autistic people have trouble with receiving, uh, receiving, receiving certain sensations. On a milder side, it could be someone who prefers to wear covers over metal jewelry, or who wears long sleeve shirts because they don't like their skin touching the air. In more severe cases, this can lead to people wearing noise-canceling headphones, you know, like the big bulky ones, for example, they need those in public. Or it could lead to people <clears throat> cringing when touching a rough surface. And when I say rough surface, I don't mean like sandpaper. Everyone cringes it when they touch sandpaper. I mean something almost smooth like the plastic chairs that you sit in for class. Now think about it this way, it's kind of like, for an autistic person, it'd be like if you were to swim naked in a pool of worms without being used to it. <laughs> Not a fun experience. <laughs> now, they, they may react in different ways, from being upset to being completely distracted, and neither of these are a good way to feel when you're in a college course. This means that learning in a classroom setting will inevitably cause some difficulty, regardless if all the precautions are taken for every student. In this case, while I would normally suggest the autistic person reach out for help, here I would suggest this is more of a Now, to cover perhaps what is considered a more stereotypical issue of autism, temper tantrums. While the story earlier described my near outburst, it didn't go as in depth about why it affected me. People with autism are just generally more sensitive to negative emotions like sadness and anger and stress. Autism is a condition which makes the person affected very self centric, very self minded. Therefore, whenever they feel one of these strong emotions, it ends up building and building and building as their brain rationalizes it for them. And then, once it gets to a certain point, the brain can only react in the way 
you know, the very easy way for it to get this emotion out, a temper tantrum. These will almost always consist of yelling or erratic motion, as well, but it can be stemmed from either sadness or anger. I used to have these very often when I was younger. I was a perfectionist, and any score below 94% drove me insane. <laughs> what I later realized was that I just had difficulties understanding my feelings, which drove me to engage in the tantrums. Now, the issue with temper tantrums isn't that it's a display of emotion. We all have those. The issue is, <clears throat> is that you aren't as in control of your actions when you have the temper tantrum. When, you're, when the autistic brain tries to express heavy emotion like this, it becomes hard to figure out what to do with all this emotion. So, like a man with duct tape over his mouth, they begin to scream and cry and shake and stomp. I know that sounds terrible, but that's truly what it feels like when you have a temper tantrum. The best way to avoid temper tantrums is to seek out therapy. And I'm talking about professional therapy, not just group or church therapy. They know how to help you control your emotions and understand the thoughts you're going through. Now this, is, this also isn't just for people with autism. This is a theme I'm trying to run where most of these solutions can be applied to people who don't, <clears throat> to people who don't have autism. Having somebody who's paid to listen to you is good for everyone. For example, if you're having thoughts that you just don't know what to do, or you have thoughts that you don't know where to go in life, having somebody to talk to about this is always a good thing. Now, I know it's expensive, and let's be honest, you don't need it because you had a bad test, like I did. <laughs> However, if you need help with something you don't understand, I highly, I highly recommend it. And don't have shame in going to the therapist either. Everyone has to do it at some point in their life, and the first step in getting help is admitting that you need help. And you even get free, you even get free therapy visits as a student at a group. Now, back to temper tantrum. If you want to begin to control them yourself, remember that there are consequences to having them. This is perhaps the biggest factor that I personally use. You could, be, you could lose friends, get suspended, or even arrested if the temper tantrum is bad enough. Other coping methods are more useful in the moment. For example, having a little fidget object in your pocket, for example, like a fidget cube or one of these fidget spinners, would help to focus your emotions in a manageable way. And leaving your, the, getting out of the situation, removing yourself from the situation, is also something I would highly recommend. Since you can leave the classroom whenever you want, go somewhere where no one can see you so you can take your emotions in and calm down very peacefully. This is something that I've used many, many times during my life, and I can say without a doubt that over any other coping factor, this has worked the most for me. Now, social situations are also another issue here at college. Rather infamously, people with autism have issues in socializing. This is due to their thought process, which makes learning social skills tough. For example, I really struggled with basic conversation until I was about 12 years old. Simple things like small talk and sarcasm are usually very foreign concepts to the person with autism. Now, fortunately, due to the newfound beneficiary and skill building programs like OU Cares here at Oakland University, they have little classes where they can actually help you develop social skills. Now, those are all basic social skills I talked about. None of them are going to earn anybody a friend. This inability to develop a lasting friendship is what often leads to depression and anxiety felt by people with autism. Normally they have their families to help, but when they're at college for eight semesters, what can they do? It's really tough for them to work with this situation. Having friends is great part of the college experience, and that's why I want to help you develop these friendships, and that's why I want, and that's why I want to encourage people. Now, I'm not saying to go out and befriend every person with autism. That's extraordinary, draconian, and completely unfeasible. Instead, go out of your way to be a nice person to everyone. A bit of kindness in the world has never hurt anybody, and it all does is bring good into this world. Now, you can't control anybody, though, and autistic people have issues that are actually even outside of their control. For example, a little behavior called stimming. This is where most people engage in some form of self-distraction, like picking at a hangnail or twirling their hair. Now, while these two examples are very common amongst everyone, not just people with autism, the difference in the level in the stimming is the degree 
and the constant uh, <clears throat> and the amount of stimming. Now, people with autism tend to stim in very noticeable ways, like flapping their hands or stomping their foot. While these are often used as the pinnacles of stereotypes for dark humor and otherwise, <clears throat> and the stereotyping, these are real social issues. Imagine every time you get excited, you flap your hands, and people then just give you these odd, inappropriate looks. Imagine if that was you. It wouldn't feel too good, would it? However, with enough, enough therapy and practice, uncontrollable stimming can be brought down to levels where you're mostly socially unnoticeable. Using myself as an example, again, I have nervous tics. My, hands tw my, hand, my left hand will twitch and my shoulders will tense up. 99% of the time, that's pretty much unnoticeable. However, it's especially unnoticeable compared to what my stimming used to look like. My left arm would actually go all the way up to my jawbone and push really hard like this. Now the issue here is that I used to have huge calluses on my hand, actually. Huge, on every single finger. And it left more permanent damage in the form of ridges on my jawbone. Of course, uh, makes for a good pickup line. Hey baby, touch my jaw. <laughs> <laughs> Now, behaviors like this obviously are going to make socializing very hard. Autistic people are very self-absorbed. Not saying that in mean context, it's just that it's the way the brain works. Fun fact, aut the aut in autism is actually a prefix. It means the same thing as an automobile or self. They're very self-centric because of the way the brain naturally functions, the way the brain thinks. It makes, them, it, makes it difficult for them to have anything more than just a passing acquaintance once in a while. And many universities like this one here, fortunately, may have offer a peer-to-peer -peer group. These help people who have autism have somebody to trust besides family. If you are some, as well as somebody to study, and if you're somebody with autism, I'd highly recommend you check out these services. As they offer a good way to stave off the loneliness and find yourself a good person to talk to. Peer-to-peer -peer services also help autistic people develop learning skills, such as note-taking, study skills. They also help them develop social skills and communication skills, all things very important once you enter the real world. And from personal experience, having a sort of mentor who's about the same age as you is invaluable for living a successful life with autism. While I personally believe in doing a lot of things yourself, having self-sufficiency, Having friends is a necessary part of life, and if you want to practice making friends, you can come to the right university, let me tell you that. You can barely go through the OC without tripping over a student's organization. There's so many different clubs, there's a chess club, there's journalism, so many different organizations where you can meet like-minded people, and they're always happy to have new members. If, even for people without autism, if you want to meet new people here at the university, this is the perfect way to do so. Now, being independent is really the final issue I wanted to talk about, and perhaps I'm focusing more on the social life of people with autism here. But this is, this is something that's very important. You're in the real world, or at the very least, a sanitized version of the real world. <laughs> when I took my first test at college, I was surprised when some guy, just halfway through the time, got up, handed his test in, and walked out the door. I didn't know what to do. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> hey, you're not supposed to go. <laughs> I later learned that most classes are like this in college. And in the real world, you're on your own. Parents can help you anymore, and everything you do is on you. Good luck. You know, I really would have more to say on this issue, but telling you to make your bed every morning is something you can learn from a less awesome person on TV or from a computer screen. Here's how, now I just want to bring this up, here's how autistic people view the world. There are hundreds of different things going on, you have no idea how to do any of them, and you have no idea what's going on in the first place, because there are so many different things to do. There is a silver lining, though. You become very, very creative. Since you always have an, in, uh, have an in, impending doom and... Since you always have an impending sense of doom and despair, you begin to realize that there are ways to stop being in doom and despair. 
Inevitably, this results in people falling over other themselves in pipe dreams and living with their parents until they're 45. But it does create some real successes in this world. Let's look at Temple Grandin, probably the most famous person in the world with autism. I had the opportunity to meet her a couple of years ago, and I can tell you that even at 70 years old, she still needs help facilitating conversations. She has an aid with her all the time. However, that hasn't gotten in the way of any of her achievements. And if I were to talk about her achievements, well, forget about the speech being an hour long. <laughs> However, we cannot use any of this as an excuse to leave people with autism in the hands of some sort of authority. College is about becoming an independent thinker, person, and most importantly, an independent adult. To give the autistic person everything they need on a silver platter only serves to damage them in the long run. For example, while talking to a special ed teacher at the Rochester School District, she told me how parents who pretty much gave in to their whims of their child on every issue would often lead to that child being it would often lead to that child having issues with graduation or going on to the real world in college. While this example does have to do with, with younger children, it still affects those of us who are in the college setting and have autism. If we have no expectations placed upon us, how will we ever become better? If, how will we become stronger if we never have to work to better ourselves? Now, it's e if I'm going to be honest, it's very easy to sort of insulate and protect people with autism in the modern world. Society makes, me feel like, makes us feel like we must, lest we be considered rude for it. Now, I, however, believe that it is up to the person with autism to conform in certain aspects to society. It would be unfair and inconsiderate to say that society should be entirely based around people who have autism. Society should become more tolerant. That's not something I contest at all. But I will not in conscious force anybody to accept an idea that is not their own. Now, I'm talking about people who don't try in their lives and have someone else do everything for them. Even if you believe that they will never learn anything, even if you feel like you're about to give up on them, keep trying. Keep pushing them on this path to greatness and hard work. People who are with autism will be kept from their full potential in this pit of caring. I believe in a policy of benign neglect, where society does try to make the best for them, tries to help them, but doesn't become too pushy in this regard. To really give them the independence that they're seeking as an adult. Here, if we were to isolate people with autism, make them some sort of protected class who can do no wrong, well, again, we'd just be stifling a lot of potential. We would never let them grow, and they would never grow and never be better, and they could you could be cutting out the reason why we're going, we'd be going to Mars in five years if you did that. Now obviously there are a spectrum of people, and some are going to need more help than others, but I'm talking about people in the mainstream of college. Now we must not, never let anybody have an excuse to give up. I started on the same footing as so many other people with autism, but I never stopped trying. I ideally thought to give up. You have no idea how easy it is for me to say, hey, it would just be really easy for me to have everyone else do everything for me. Don't let somebody slip behind. Tough love is still love. Even if they shrink and recoil from it, it's still good for them. An autistic person is still a good a person after all. They're going, even though they have trouble with learning, they're still going to learn. Eventually. Trust me, that eventually is a very key word there. <laughs> And I wanted to show the world that somebody with autism can do great things. And if being up on this podium in front of all of you has shown anything, I have. It's up to you and you alone to make a difference. I know, I know, this is the most cliche bit of morality ever said in human language, but one person can make a difference. This, that all being said, I want the best for you. Autism is a growing condition with more and more diagnoses each year. However, autism is not you. We rely so much on buzzwords and identity nowadays that we completely forget that individuals made the world that we live in. George Washington wasn't a great general because he was American. Yes, I know he was technically British. Sue me, fellow history nerds, sue me. <laughs> he was a great general who happened to be American. You can claim hundreds of different parts about his identity, but are any of those George Washington? Likewise, is simply autism, is that you? Are you autism? Can autism be a major part of your identity? Yes, 
Yes, it can. Can it be your identity? No, it shouldn't. We should break this mental bond that we have to this idea that we all subject ourselves to and be who we are. Now, yes, I did bring up how important becoming a part of society is. None of this means that you should be normal. Normal is something very tenuous, a six-letter word which snuffs out all, meaning of, all meanings of individuality. Don't let anybody stop you from living your life to the fullest. Your ideas are your ideas, and you can change the world with them. As the late and great Stan Lee put it, if you have an idea that, is genuinely, that you genuinely think is good, don't let some idiot talk you out of it. That goes for everyone here. Don't let some idiot talk you out of those awesome ideas you have. One day, that tree house with a slide that goes all around the tree and up into the space might become a reality. You never know. You do you. And don't you forget it. And also, be kind in this world. Again, just bring it up as a little bit of a footnote. Being kind makes a difference in the world. I'm Spencer Kelly, self-advocate for autism, dual enrollment student, and shameless self-promoter of my company, The Expedition Soap Company. Luxury soaps at reasonable prices. You can check them out online at the website on the card. Thank you all for listening. all again for, for coming. Thanks to Spencer for sharing with us today his insight and his ideas. Um, we were going to open it up to questions in case anybody had questions um, that they'd like to um, have Spencer offer his, his thoughts on. <laughs> Spencer, what an impressive speech. I just want to say I just can't say enough of uh, how, how impressed I am. And um, it's amazing to see where what you've done at such a young age, and I uh, just have no idea where you're going to go in life because I'm sure it's going to be a brilliant future for you. So I'm, and I'm very glad that you're part of the Oakland University community. Um, what would you say would be the best way for faculty to help identify and maybe to approach students who don't come to them? Because there's oftentimes, you know, I've noticed that there's people who I think could use a little bit of help, but I'm not really sure. You know, I don't want to single them out. Is there, do you have any thoughts on that? Or is that kind of out yeah. too much? Yeah, again, thank you so much. Uh, you don't have to compliment me, I'm just doing my job here. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, I get where you're coming from. Sometimes people don't come forward, and sometimes people wallow in their own emotions, and sometimes you need to be the driving force there. Spotting somebody who is having trouble Usually, obviously, you can look at grades, but you know those are pretty much limited to the professor and the, the student only. But maybe you look for mannerisms. For example, people with autism tend to be shy. They tend to have their eyes dirty around the room because they can never focus their attention on one thing. Oh, is that squirrel over there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, definitely by focusing on the mannerisms, you can usually spot someone who's having trouble. Perhaps somebody who is seeming to not care about the class. That's generally somewhere that you can spot someone having trouble. Very easy to do. Just look for a person who sits in the back and just kind of nods their head at the professor. And for somebody who, and if you just see somebody around campus who you feel like is having trouble, just start up a conversation with them. Just say, hey, what's going on? And usually by the way they respond, you can tell if they're stressed or if they have an issue going. Obviously, I just, I can't speak for everyone because everyone is a very different in the end. But overall, those are what I would look for. Again, thank you for your question. Can I follow up to that myself and just ask, so if someone, um, if a staff or faculty came up to you, um, how would you feel if um, they just started to ask how you're doing, how are you doing with the class, is there any extra help you might need to be successful? How would, how would you feel in that situation? Well, I can understand how someone might feel uncomfortable in that situation. I mean, me personally, I would feel, all right, all right there clearly, there's clearly some interest that they have, so let's hear it out. But admittedly, yeah, that does seem, yeah, it is a bit out of the blue to do something like that. And if you're looking for a less out-of-the-blue way, maybe just by an anonymous um, 
like a survey monkey or something like that. Just make a, maybe make a survey of how you're doing in the class with all anonymous results. And maybe, because again, they are a busy person, maybe focus on office hours, try and bring up office hours a lot so that maybe this person can be a bit more one-on-one -on -one with you. And as well as that, generally just try and see where a lot of people may be struggling so you can, you can tailor it so most, as not only this person can be helped, but also more people around them can be helped. Well, thank you for your question, Kristen. Any other questions? Well, thanks to everybody else for coming today, all of the faculty, students, and staff from Oakland University. Thanks again to Spencer. Thank you to Spencer's family who's here with us today. Um, I think we should give not only one more round of applause to Spencer, but also to his family. And to everybody for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful, not, not only the rest of your day, but the rest of April is Autism Awareness Month. So um, enjoy the rest of Autism Awareness Month as well. We look forward to seeing you again on campus. Take care. <laughs>